Welcome everyone. So today I want to talk more about stringed instruments and some of the specific physical ideas that come into the design and the working of stringed instruments that go beyond what we've already talked about. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is actually related to the demo I just did which is uh, an interesting point about stringed instruments, and that is that the strings don't actually make that much sound. And so I was just playing an electric bass, and it was pretty quiet because this instrument is, is it looks like a regular guitar, uh, but it's designed to be amplified. And so it's a different design. It has this solid body instead of the usual kind of guitar which would have a thin piece of wood on top and then a hollow cavity. And so the point is, the important thing is that if you have a string going back and forth on its own, it is pretty narrow and it really doesn't move that much air around it. And so it actually is not very efficient at transferring its energy into sound waves. And so that is why when we think about musical instruments that are meant to be played acoustically, so acoustic stringed instruments, uh, they're really they're not just some stretched strings. There is usually a lot more to it, and so the the working of something like a violin or an acoustic guitar, the way it works is that you have your string vibrating but then those vibrations are actually transferred into other sorts of vibrations of the body of an instrument and of air inside the cavity of the instrument. So I've got a picture here of a violin. And so if you think about the violin, so the main source of the vibrations would be the strings that you pluck or bow. And we're gonna be talking about bowing in a, in a video shortly. Uh, so you you get the string vibrating, but again, that is not really producing that much sound on its own. What's really happening is that that string, it's stretched over this object here, which is called the bridge of the violin. And so that string causes the, the bridge to vibrate. And the bridge causes the top plate of the violin, which is which is like a thin piece of wood to vibrate. And that has a much larger area. And so the, when that top plate starts vibrating, then you have a transfer of your vibrational energy into sound energy that's, uh, that's much more uh, efficient. That's, so it's producing a lot more sound energy than just the vibration of the string. And so while there's even more than that, so the instrument is hollow. And so you have air inside the instrument and that can also vibrate. And so the, the motion of the, this top plate of the violin causes the air inside the instrument to vibrate and that's open to the outside here. And so the vibrations of the air inside the instrument also can transmit energy to the surrounding air. And so the idea here is that what you want is your instrument to have a lot of different natural modes of vibration. So we talked about how Something like a something like a drum head. Okay, so something complicated like that. Um, it is something that has a lot of different natural vibration frequencies. So, like the stretch string had this series of harmonics. There's a set of natural frequencies for something like a drum head or a piece of wood. And generally, because those are more complicated two-dimensional objects, they can vibrate in lots of ways. And so what can happen then is that when the string starts vibrating and then that causes the bridge of the violin to, to vibrate, then it's, it's likely that that vibration frequency will be close to one of the natural frequencies of the instrument. And then you would get a resonance phenomenon. The bridge vibration is, is driving the vibration of the, of the instrument or the air inside the instrument uh, if the frequencies match. Okay. And so well-designed instruments are ones where you have many, many different 
ways of vibration, many, many kind of different natural vibration frequencies that match well with the kind of range of frequencies that you want to be playing with your vibrating strings. So I have a couple of demonstrations that I wanted to show you related to this. And so the first one is just a really simple example where you have one thing that's the source of the vibration. Um, so this is going to be the tuning fork here. Let's go to, let's go back to our, our main view here. There I am. Okay. So we've got the tuning fork and so the tuning fork, it really does not produce a lot of sound on its own. So if I, if I have that vibrating, I can't really hear it until I put it right up to my ear. Or if I put it right up to the microphone, then you can hear it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take the tuning fork and I'll get it vibrating. Then I'm just going to touch it to the surface of the drum. And so this is a lot like the, the string being connected by the bridge, which is going to be this part of the tuning fork to the surface, uh, the top plate of the violin or the guitar. So I'll turn my mic sensitivity up for a minute. Okay, so hopefully you could hear that. So it's still on the quiet side, but definitely was a lot louder. So when I touched the tuning fork to the surface of the drum, then we could hear it much more clearly than when it wasn't touching the surface of the drum. So what was happening there is that the drum probably had some particular way of vibrating that had a natural frequency that's close to the frequency of that tuning fork. And then we got something like this resonance phenomenon where the tuning fork was causing the vibration of the surface of the drum. And then that big area was better at transmitting um, its energy, its vibration energy into the energy of sound waves. Let me just do one more demo here with the guitar. And so this one, I'm just going to emphasize how both the vibration of the body of the instrument, as well as the vibration of the air inside the instrument contribute to the, to the resonance of the instrument, to the, its ability to produce sound. And so uh, one thing that's interesting to do is I, I can just talk or, or hum into the, into the cavity of the instrument. Hello. Hello. Uh... Hello, 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 hello. So there's, uh, there's some particular um, kind of low frequency, which I think is a little bit lower than the A string here, uh, that that's, this air seems to want to vibrate with. And so the, this vibration of air inside the instrument is contributing a lot to, uh, to the, the low end of the sound of the guitar. So just to demonstrate that, well, you've already heard the guitar with the, the uh, electric bass there with, without any um, thin top plate and without any inside. It was really quiet. So if I just cover up the air hole here, so we'll, we'll kind of hear what the guitar sounds like with just the vibrations of the body. Um, and so, so we still have the strings. They're still connected to the bridge. The, bo the book is not really touching the strings. And so we could play something. All right, there is a little bit of contact there. Um, and the guitar has gone out of tune since the last time I used it. Uh, so, but now let's hear the, uh, let's hear it, hear it with the opening. Okay, so it's a, it's it's quite a bit um, richer of a sound with the 
air coming from the inside with, sorry, the air um, oscillating inside and being able to transmit its energy to the outside through the, through the, uh, through the opening. Okay, back to the slides. And so you might wonder, well, you know, how do, how do you know how to design the instrument so that it has all of these good vibration frequencies that match well with the frequencies of the notes that you want to play? And really, it was just a process of trial and error. Over many years, people played around with the shape of the instrument and just ended up with these particular shapes, like the shape of this violin uh, is very complicated. And this is just the result of people noticing, well, if I make uh, this indentation here, then it sounds better than before. If I make the air hole this particular shape, then it sounds better than before. Inside the violin, it's not as symmetrical as it is outside. And, and that helps contribute to having a lot of different vibrational frequencies. Okay. So I just actually wanted to show you uh, one more instrument here which is which is this uh, this is a, a hammered dulcimer so this this was actually made by my wife's grandfather his name was george unrein senior and so this instrument is an ancient sort of instrument uh, it's the precursor of the piano in a sense because it's it's just a set of strings uh, so, so we have several strings for each note that you want to play and those are stretched between these from this tuning peg over here to another peg on the other side and it's stretched over a over a bridge here and so the bridge then transfers the vibrations of the strings to the vibrations of of this top plate which we would call a soundboard but the instrument is also hollow so there's vibrations of air inside the instrument uh, that can come out through the that can uh, sort of transfer their vibrations to the surrounding air through these holes. And so this is quite a resonant instrument. Uh, so it's quite loud. I'm not sure if that comes across. And I, I will show you a, a little bit of a, a demonstration of that here. Uh, so I asked my wife just to play uh, a simple folk tune Okay, so this is, this is like. So there's, that's an instrument where there are really many versions of this. Um, so this is, we refer to as a hammered dulcimer, uh, but this is an instrument that's been around for thousands of years. And so there's a version of this in, in China. There's a version in, um, in the Middle East uh, called the Santur and there's European versions. And so you, people play something like this all over the world. And as I mentioned, uh, this is like the precursor to the piano. So basically the piano, the idea of the piano is just to take this instrument and kind of automate the hammering. So instead of actually using the hammers with our hands, you have this keyboard, this complicated keyboard mechanism where the hammers are activated by pressing the keys of the piano. And so just to show you inside of a piano, so similar to that dulcimer, you have, at least at the high end, you have several strings for each note that you're going to play on the piano. So for each key, you have several strings up high. Down low, you have uh, only one string for the, for the lowest few notes, um, lowest octave, and then there's two strings, and then higher up, there's three strings per note. And those strings, again, they're attached to a fixed peg on one end and a tuning peg on the other end. 
and they go over a bridge which connects the strings to the soundboard which is uh, just a big uh, plate of wood below the strings and and so that vibrational energy of the strings that you get when the hammer strikes the string is then transferred to the soundboard and that produces uh, that helps produce the louder sound that we associate with the piano. Uh, on the right hand side here you have a little bit of a close-up of the action of the piano where so basically when when none of the keys are pressed you have the, all these dampers on each of the strings so that it's not um, too resonant and when you press the key then the damper comes up to allow the string to vibrate freely and at the same time, there's a mechanism where this felt covered hammer that you can see below comes up and, and strikes the string. So this is in a grand piano where that's coming up from the bottom in an upright piano uh, that would be that would be going horizontally. Okay. And so that's it for this video. In the next one, we're going to talk about the differences in sound, how we understand the differences in sound between instruments where the string is plucked or where the string is hit with a hammer or where the string is bowed and that all has to do with the evolution of the sound from when it comes on to when the sound stops.